who's, who's able to join us today. Uh, my name is Ryan Scott. I'm the Vice President uh, of Policy with HPW Resources, but today I'm wearing my hat as a board member of the Renewable Energy Alliance for Houston. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with the Renewable Energy Alliance, we call it REAL. Uh, we're a network of professionals focused on supporting technologies and industries to help uh, help our region continue its pivot forward towards the future in terms of energy production and energy consumption. Uh, REAL launched recently when its founding members recognized that there was a need for a dedicated organization to bring together thought, lead, thought leaders and innovators to propel, propel Houston forward and to maintain Houston's position as the energy capital. And you know we, we've done this with the conviction that Houston is uniquely positioned with the people, the expertise, the infrastructure and the capital uh, to submit to cement its standing as the energy future of the capital. I'm sorry, the energy capital of the future, pardon me. If you want to get some more information about real uh, go to our website it's renewableenergyhouston.org um, so there's information about uh, membership opportunities and events there uh, but today we're going to focus specifically on offshore wind in the gulf of mexico uh, there's been a lot of wind development around the world uh, in, in the u.s it's mostly been on the east coast but we are really privileged today to have a group of experts on offshore wind development uh, to join us today to kind of walk through what that might look like in the Gulf of Mexico and how it might interact with Houston. Uh, so I'm going to start with Barry Obiel, who's the Deputy Director in the U.S. Department of Interior's Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Uh, and Barry's based out of the New Orleans office. And one of the reasons I asked Barry to join us today is that he played a role, uh, a, a large role, in developing a study uh, with NREL that kind of outlined the wind resource in the Gulf, you know, it really, really helps developers understand what's actually there in terms of wind. Uh, and I'm going to read a little bit about Barry's background here. Uh, before Barry was with BOEM, he served as a senior environmental regulatory specialist with the Department of Defense and specifically the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, and with the, the Army Corps, he regulated oil and gas exploration activities, uh, coastal restoration projects, and industrial development. As as part of this position, he was awarded the Coastal America Partnership Award in 2003 with a letter of commendation from President George Bush. In 2007, Barry joined the Minerals Management Service as a NEPA coordinator, where he coordinated the development of the agency's first environmental impact statement for Cape Wind, which you may be aware of, as well as environmental impact statements for oil and gas lease sales. In 2012, Barry served as the Deputy Regional Supervisor of the Office of Environment, and in 2016, he accepted his current position as the deputy director for Bohm's New Orleans office. So I'm going to turn it over to Barry. Um, we're going to hear more about James Cotter and Benjamin Laura in a few minutes here. But for now, Barry's going to tell us a little bit about um, the study and some of the background for wind in the Gulf of Mexico. So I'm going to queue up the slides. And Barry, uh, you're up. Great, thank you. <clears throat> First, I want to thank you for inviting me to have this discussion today. Renewable energy is a really big thing for us. Um, we began this when the Energy Security Act of 2005 gave the responsibility of offshore renewable to the Marine Mineral Service, and that was Cape Wind was our first project. That was two and a half years, and anybody familiar with that project knows there's a lot of challenges to getting wind uh, structures into the water. However, we did complete that EIS and uh, unfortunately, I don't think anything ever, any project actually ended up in the water, but we do have off of Block Island an offshore project. But what we're mainly interested in, if you go to the next slide, is our mission. The after uh, MMS was divided, we became the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and our two sister agencies, Bessie and Honor, each have different responsibilities. So BOEM is responsible for the regulating the oil and gas, renewable and marine minerals in federal waters. We have four primary regions, Alaska, Atlantic, Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific. You're more interested in the Gulf of Mexico. So what we recently did was re reorganize the Office of the Regional Director in New Orleans, and we created an emerging program section of which renewable energy is a part. We consider renewable in the Gulf of Mexico a, an emerging and developing program. Next slide. 
So a few years ago, we began the process of reaching out to states, state governors, uh, stakeholders, partners, federal partners, and discussing the possibility of renewable energy placement in the Gulf of Mexico. One of the offshoots of that discussion was uh, commissioning a, a study from NREL, which looked at potential in the Gulf of Mexico for renewable energy, a variety of, of different types. The primary focus after the end of the study was on wind because there are technological challenges with wave and tidal and solar in the Gulf of Mexico. However, we do have strong wind corridors off the coast of Texas and some of Louisiana. All of us who have been through this hurricane season knows wind is no problem in the Gulf of Mexico. Managing it might be a bit more of an issue. Next slide. So what this study did was look at the capacity, the location, the type of corridors, and the benefits. So my experiences with Cape Wind were, were good because it taught me what the relationship is with the coastal states and offshore. The first step in the coastal state is incorporating in their portfolio standards for renewable offshore energy. Without incorporating that into their portfolio, there's not really the impetus to develop offshore wind. So with that being said, we reached out to each state. It's taken a couple years. Louisiana is now the first one who is establishing a task force for renewable. We're very excited about that. This is something that we've been hoping uh, to, to do because along the Atlantic seaboard, that was that's where they're at right now with the Renewable Energy Task Force. And it discusses all the possibilities of placement, uh, economic, environmental, the uh, how the states address that. So right now, to my knowledge, we don't have that in the coastal states. But what we want to do as an agency is be prepared because we know it's coming. Next slide. This is more of a, an idea of where we uh, decided the wind resources were. Off the coast of Florida, not so much. The eastern seaboard, uh, eastern Gulf of Mexico coastline didn't really have the consistency and the, uh, the uh, wind that we would need to make it economically feasible. Texas and Louisiana, especially Texas, definitely has that capacity. And I believe this slideshow will be available to you so you can digest that later on. But it gives you the numbers and the results of the study. And you can see is the Gulf states where it's located. We can't compare it to the Eastern Corridor, the Northeastern. We don't have that type of wind resources, but we do. And it, it's up to the states and the technology to make it economically feasible for us to go ahead and, or not for us, but for, for those interests to go ahead and start uh, developing wind farms in the Gulf. Next slide. You look at this slide and I'm not an economist. So I won't even begin to explain to you the relationship between the kilowatt hour and the renewable energy. It's not, I'm more of an environmental person. But the bottom line is energy is fairly cheap in a coastal region. The price per kilowatt, uh, when the last time I checked, is about half of the price per kilowatt in the Northeast. So while it's a blessing for us to be able to have relatively cheap energy, it doesn't provide the impetus to go ahead and, and invest heavily in wind, not yet. So what has to happen is, and what we really don't want to happen is the price of kilowatt to go up or the technology to become better so that the energy is produced cheaper and the energy makes it to the shoreline, to the, uh, sort, the centers that could utilize it and the states incorporate into their portfolios uh, offshore energy renewable. Next slide. So this is a pretty good slide to show you average wind speeds. Uh, as you can see off of Corpus Christi and moving up the Texas shoreline, that is where you're gonna find the, the, the strongest and more consistent winds. 
If you're familiar with the Outer Continental Shelf, the state of Texas is nine nautical miles from their shoreline. State of Louisiana, uh, Alabama, and Mississippi is three nautical miles, and Florida is nine nautical miles. So in Texas, when we talk about the Outer Continental Shelf, you've got to go nine miles out. So the state of Texas has that much water available to them if they wanted to, from the state point of view, incorporate wind farms in their uh, state waters. So we have had discussion with the state of Texas and with the uh, GLO. And right now, I believe, to my knowledge, they don't have any plans to install wind farms or to work on leasing out their state waters. That could have changed. That discussion took place about a year and a half ago. Uh, next slide. So what's interesting is that the U.S., we have 33% of the shallow water resource is in the U.S., I mean, in the Gulf of Mexico, excuse me. We also have a very strong infrastructure already in place. This is very important because servicing wind farms requires infrastructure. It requires ports that can handle the, uh, the uh, boats going back and forth and, and bringing out the heavy equipment. We have all that already in the place. So that's in our favor, but what's not in our favor is hurricanes. You have to look at what structural design will have to take place to ensure that these wind farms are not destroyed by hurricanes. Uh, off the, in the North Sea, they actually have very strong winds and I've talked to some of my Norwegian counterparts on some of the technological challenges they've had in the North Sea. It can be done. It's just going to require the, the uh, appetite for an investor and the technology to, to do, this, do so. We also have lower average wind speeds than the North Atlantic, which that means is the turbines are going to have to be more efficient. It's got to be economically feasible. If it's not economically feasible, it's going to be hard to get the commercial interest to come in and do that. And then we have a softer soil. It doesn't mean it's impossible. It means, again, there are engineering challenges to ensuring that the monopoles that are put in stay, stay where you put them. Next slide. So there's another, there's a, an additional counterpart that we have been uh, utilizing in the Gulf of Mexico is our yards. We have a lot of structural design yards. And they have provided a lot of the jackets and the uh, structures to the Northeast. Now, I know that is not exactly what we're talking about today, but we already are using, redesigning and repurposing some of our shipyards and some of our oil and gas fabricators to go ahead and, and make this stuff, put this, put this stuff together and ship it to the Northeast. Well, if we can ship it to the Northeast, we can do it here in the Gulf of Mexico and we can do it cheaper because we have the skilled labor, we have the ports, we have the yards. All we need now is the investors to come in and the states to encourage the utilization of offshore wind. So when all these forces come to play, you will have renewable energy in the Gulf of Mexico. I can't tell you how long it will be. It could be five years, it could be 10 years. I will tell you, Bone will be ready. We uh, just hired a new person on board dedicated specifically to renewable energy. And we are also are getting ready right now. We're working with our Northeast counterparts so that we will have the process in place when the interest or when the uh, competitive lease comes in, we can go ahead and start issuing our advertising competitive leasing in the Gulf. So we'll be ready. And the question is, is when will our operators be ready to come in and secure those resources and produce renewable energy? I think that's the last slide. That's it. So the long and short of it is our agency is responsible for regulating renewable energy in the Gulf of Mexico. It's a complicated process. You have to do competitive bidding. Uh, for me to explain the entire process right now it would be very difficult, but I am available. Uh, we can provide my email address 
So if you have any detailed questions on what the leasing process would be, I would be glad to respond to you. So I'll, I'll get my uh, email address to Ron and he can provide that to all those that are listening in. And we'll walk through it. It's uh, again, it's very complicated, but like anything else the government does, it takes a while, but it will get done. That's it. Hey, Barry, that was great. Thanks so much. Um, I'm gonna ask, I, I should have mentioned this earlier, but if you do have questions, uh, please submit them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And we'll, so we'll go through the presenters and, uh, and at the end, we'll follow up with those questions. Um, so you've got a little time to formulate your thoughts before we go on. Um, I'm gonna pivot to, to James Cotter. Uh, and James Cotter is the general manager of Offshore Wind Americas at Shell. Um, James has more than 15 years of experience in the offshore and renewables uh, space. Uh, he started his career in 2000 in the startup space uh, with some startup companies and he moved into power in 2004 in renewables shortly thereafter. Uh, James has background in both onshore and offshore wind uh, in the operations, execution and development space alongside with integration and trading, uh, mergers and acquisitions, risk management and business development. James has worked through the full life cycle of renewable operating portfolios for both onshore and offshore assets. And he has a bachelor of science degree in chemistry. It's impressive uh, from York University. So without further ado, James, uh, looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, delighted to be here today talking about offshore wind and the importance of the Gulf of Mexico. It really is Shell's offshore heartland here in the USA and also key to our energy transition ambitions. We were the first IOC to announce an ambition for the carbon reduction intensity of our products back in 2017. The world needs to move to a cleaner energy system if it's to meet growing energy demand while tackling climate change. Energy has shaped our past and I can be certain that it will shape our future. In April 2020, Shell shared our new ambition to become a net zero emissions energy business by 2050 or sooner. We aim to make power a significant business for the long term, one that can sit alongside our oil and gas and chemicals businesses. This requires being involved at almost every stage of the process, from generating electricity through wind and solar, to buying and selling it, to supplying it directly to customers. Our strong financial backing and history of delivering complex energy projects, especially here in the Gulf of Mexico, combined with our power ambitions, means that we're excited to be playing our part in the important energy transition that we all need. I think what's really important to say is I, I believe that the energy company of the future will be integrated and will not focus on optimizing single assets, uh, single electrons, or just the cost of energy from an asset, um, but on delivering the right vector of energy to the right place at the right time. So for me, it's not just about offshore generation, it's about how we combine that uh, with others, uh, other, other assets and, and other technologies. So offshore wind is one important element, but it has to be combined with onshore generation, solar, um, wind, dispatchable uh, sources such as storage, hydrogen, and importantly, traditional fuels as well. You know, um, certainly when we're looking at capacity to achieve the integrated energy basin that can meet our customer needs and desires. And how we achieve that, let's be honest, is likely to include offshore wind in the Gulf of Mexico if the political and commercial stars Align. It is a very powerful resource that we can combine, but it should never be looked at in isolation. So similar to early oil and gas in the Gulf of Mexico, offshore wind development may follow a similar evolution where we moved from fixed bottom, close shore, and then out into deeper waters. Or it may jump straight over the fixed bottom element. Um, you know, for example, South Texas, where wind resource is strong, but there's not much room um, for, for fixed bottom projects, it gets relatively deep quite, quite quickly. So floating offshore wind, we think, uh, unlocks renewable energy potential. Um, around 80% of offshore wind resources is located in waters of more than 60 meters depth, where bottom fixed offshore wind tends to become economically unattractive. So floating offshore wind is a natural complement to bottom fix. Certainly in the Gulf of Mexico, we may see shallower moving to deeper. Um, it's certainly not a competitor but we believe that floating offshore wind has the ability to reach cost comparative levels quickly. 
So I think great potential in floating wind technology, which can be installed in deeper waters than current fixed technologies can open up new areas to offshore wind. And, you know, Gulf of Mexico is, is a perfect case in point. Um, so how Shell are approaching that? In 2019, we acquired a French offshore wind company, Eofi, uh, which trebled the size of our, our, our wind team and, and brought in floating wind expertise. And we added new pilot projects to our portfolios. Um, so, you know, in France and Denmark uh, with Seasdale Offshore Technology, um, partnering with Energy. Um, now, the, the most important thing of, of talking about floating technologies is, you know, the, the foundations can be assembled without the same infrastructure need that fixed foundations require. And offshore wind tends to require very large lay down areas, uh, port upgrades and the like. Floating technology maybe is a way that we're looking at that means that we can deliver commercialized projects with existing ports and infrastructure and using existing vessel spreads and existing uh, skills uh, and technologies rather than needing to create offshore wind specific hubs. So when, when Tetraspar is configured in floating formation, the platform can be anchored to the seabed with mooring lines. Um, so so you know, normal catenary lines. In shallow water, it can be fixed to the seabed using a gravity based structure. So we see that floating is not just feasible, but has the opportunity to become dominant if it can be commercialized successfully and become cost competitive. And there's a bit of a race globally to be the first region to really tap into this. And the Gulf of Mexico has all of the right areas where, and, and all of the right boxes to tick. You've got a skilled workforce, you know how to run energy infrastructure projects. You have ports that are used to um, supporting complex offshore energy projects. You know, the ability to site floating wind also around demand centers with deeper water and then combined with potential other technologies means that, you know, to Barry's point, you have to be cost effective. The, the, the energy cost has to be in a level that's supportable and with value. Um, and again, having flexibility and maybe a little bit less sensitivity to the seabed conditions means that you can potentially achieve that because you can start to standardize as far as standardization can, can occur. The foundations you're delivering across the wider area, which can drive down your cost per, per unit. So moving back to, to, to how we, we view uh, offshore and, and uh, uh, within Shell, I mean, we, we in Shell see the energy transition as, as key. We formed new energies in 2016. We've been busy. Uh, we've got a pipeline with potential to ge generate over six gigawatts when, when constructed. Um, we've started to make significant asset investments um, that really highlight our appetite. And in the US on the East Coast, we have Mayflower and Atlantic Shore. We're, we're really at the start of the journey in the US at localizing an industry that, that is going to be one of the largest globally. I mean, uh, the East Coast states have a 30 gigawatt target. You put that in context, offshore wind in the UK has been running for 20 years. We have, uh, or they have, 8.5 gigawatts on the bars currently with a target to get to 30 gigawatts in 2030. So they've taken almost th well, 30 years uh, is their target to move from nothing to 30 gigawatts. The East Coast is you know, 15 years to get to 30 gigawatts. And we shouldn't underestimate the, the challenge, but also the opportunity that that comes with. And I think when you look at the challenge and the opportunity, you know, really developers like Shell, we have a long and proud history of working collaboratively with the supply chain. We deliver projects through the supply chain, with the supply chain. A lot of the value that we see is through and with supply chain. And we, we think that partnerships and long-term relationships should make us more competitive. You know, and it, it's key in helping offshore wind penetrate markets such as the Gulf of Mexico in providing the anchor investment to create integrated energy offering by utilizing the existing skills that we're used to working with over the last 40 to 60 years. So, our perspective on offshore wind in the Gulf of Mexico is, is really around um, you know, advancing and providing deep water technologies that are cost competitive, um, building on our uh, history and experience of operating uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, I think 2018 marked our 40th year pioneering, innovating the deep water area era. Um, and we see opportunities to do exactly the same for offshore wind. Our long-standing partnership with government, communities, other stakeholders provide 
real opportunities to expand our collaborative efforts to integrate renewables into the energy mix. But as I come back to Barry, it has to be done right, it has to be cost effective, and it has to have a, you know, long term planning to get there. We, we see there is real regulatory advantage and strong relationships between the offshore wind industry and the federal and state regular regulators in the Gulf. I mean, you know, some of the challenges we have in the East Coast and we see in offshore wind in the East Coast is around how we can assess the cumulative uh, effects and the impacts of what are very large infrastructure projects. The Gulf of Mexico has a long history of delivering permitting and consenting and all of the associated requirements around that for getting infrastructure projects going in a very responsible um, way. So, you know, uh, Boehm and Bessie and the Gulf regions and groups have been key to that and, and have built a lot of knowledge um, over the last few years. So, you know, we, we see Houston absolutely as the energy hub of the region, um, Shell and many of the supply chain companies and expertise supporting energy developments in this region are based in Houston. And we also see the crossover of them coming into offshore wind on the East Coast. And that can only strengthen the potential delivery of offshore wind um, in the Gulf of Mexico. You've got great population centers on the Gulf Coast, um, which also helps. Yeah, And with floating winds, so fixed fixed bottom wind with monopiles and jackets, you tend to be relatively sensitive to the ground conditions and water depth. Floating to a degree, I mean, you're obviously sensitive to how deep it is because it needs to be deep enough uh, for the floating to be effective, but then you're no longer as sensitive to the seabed conditions and you can start to position the wind farm in the best place from whatever the receptors or the impacts that you're seeing. So it could be visual, it could be um, closer to the demand center in terms of physical line of getting the power there. You can move it away or towards areas where there is recreational activities and like. So floating offshore wind provides more flexibility uh, to be able to deliver cost effective power. So in summary, I've been talking for a while, I, we think absolutely there's an opportunity um, and offshore wind can build that opportunity, but it has to be part of an integrated offshore uh, or in integrated energy offering, not, not offshore wind on its own. It has to be combined with storage or other energy vectors, hydrogen uh, production, for example, or, or peakers and, and fossil. We see that the Gulf of Mexico, Boehm, Bessie region um, is, is a great opportunity to support the permitting of large infrastructure energy projects. You know, it's been done. We understand best practice. Uh, we've got good relationships and we think it can really help move to a, a more um, a more uh, predictable timeline for gaining the right consents in the right way. And predictability is really important. Transmission is an area that there is a, a huge opportunity for Gulf of Mexico. You know, I think the developments are always going to lag the East Coast, and I, but I think you may lead in terms of floating. If you're lagging, that gives the time to be able to plan effectively how you can get that power to shore and how that power can then be used within the system correctly. So less of a run for radials to individual projects and more of a planned, how do you upgrade, where do you need those connections to be in order to, to support the system far more effectively. Um, we think the wind resource is absolutely there. It's interesting, it's not quite as uniform, maybe requires some different technologies some new technologies. We see those coming through certainly with the newer um, uh, global areas that are pushing for offshore wind have similar requirements. Um, you know, the current order 12A uh, does restrict leasing in the Eastern region, but there's still a, a huge potential and a large resource there. And, and maybe that temporal restriction may not uh, in any way influence um, the, the, the development. Um, industrial ports and space, exist and know how to support energy infrastructure and, and storage and installation of wind assets. And that's that's key. And jacket fabrication capabilities and, and general fabrication capabilities in the region means that big infrastructure is understood and can be supported and can be delivered. And we really shouldn't underestimate that. So yeah, obviously as GM offshore wind for Shell, I'd say offshore wind is a real opportunity for the Gulf of Mexico. Um, really suits services and capabilities. Um, I think the one thing we need to remember is when we try to deliver something new, the most important thing is to bring stakeholders with us and educate carefully. Um, but with political will, uh, I think in the USA to create an industry that can be localized and address challenges around installation, 
um, with foundation designs that are probably focused towards floating that can be fabricated locally and create real long-term jobs and, and employment and skills. It's going to ha help make this area a real linchpin of the US industry of the future. Thank you, James. That was great. And um, I'm, I'm going to have to chew on several of the points you made for a while and uh, digest them a little bit. But there are, keep in mind, uh, there are questions coming in and already a few for you. Um, so you can access the chat function and see those. And same, same goes for Barry. Um, I'm going to turn to uh, Benjamin Laura, uh, who is the Senior Vice President of Offshore Projects at Oceaneering. Um, so a quick bio on Ben. Ben joined Oceaneering in 2014 as the director of subsea surface subsea services, uh, supporting integrated projects and process improvement initiatives. Uh, ben was promoted to vice president of service technology and rentals in 2015, uh, where he was responsible for Oceaneering's ROV tooling, uh, the IWOCS service, and new integrated solutions businesses. Uh, ben was promoted to senior vice president of service and rental in March 2020. In, in September of 2020, Oceaneering realigned its operating segments to reflect uh, how Oceaneering manages its businesses and supports ongoing efforts to achieve greater cost efficiencies. And as a result, Ben now leads the Offshore Projects Group. Uh, prior to joining Oceaneering, Ben worked for Baker Hughes as the Vice President and Managing Director for Baker Hughes, pardon me, for Baker Hughes Doe Brazil. So Ben, thanks for being here. and. Uh, Looking forward to hearing your presentation. Hi, thanks, Ryan. Um, can you confirm that you can see the presentation? I can see it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, and thanks for the fantastic introduction. I, um, I really wanted to cover today kind of three topics. Uh, we have a very broad and diverse audience, so I wanted to give a little bit of an introduction to oceaneering, uh, what we do and, and, uh, and how we do it. I wanted to talk a little bit about offshore wind and, and what we see being developed uh, and what kind of technologies are rolling out. It is a very exciting space, right? Where uh, new tech, uh, you know, obsoletes old tech in a matter of months in some cases. And then I, I had a slide on uh, Europe lessons learned, a couple of things that I, I think we should think about as we, uh, we open up this opportunity in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so with that, I'll go to, to Oceaneering. Uh, Oceaneering was formed in the 1960s. Mike Hughes and Johnny Johnson had formed a small diving company, and they had aspirations of being a global diving company. So they named the company Worldwide Divers. Um, and then about five years later, they decided to merge with, uh, with a few other companies and change the name to Oceaneering, which they thought really represented what they wanted to do. The, the tough engineering uh, for offshore industries. Um, you know, today we really develop products and services for, for the use throughout the life cycle of the offshore oil field uh, from drilling to decommissioning. Um, but we're probably best known for having a, uh, uh, you know, the premier fleet of work class uh, ROVs. And, um, you know, we do quite a bit of work outside of, of oil and gas now as well, including offshore wind, uh, the aerospace industry, uh, defense, as well as even theme parks. One of the keys here is that uh, we have our core values, and I think our core values uniquely places us to solve some of the most complex problems. Uh, uh, problems that, that are out there. And we really aim to solve the unsolvable. So our vision really is to create industry changing, uh, technically creative solutions. And, uh, and we're willing to do that underwater, on land or in space. And we do that by utilizing our core values that I referenced of doing things right, solving complex problems, outperforming expectations, owning the challenge and growing together. So this infographic um, somewhat uh, represents all of the different areas of, uh, of the subsea world that, that Oceaneering works in and captures a few of the things that we do in land and space as well. The, um, 
our company is organized around five main operating segments. Uh, our biggest operating segment is subsea robotics. Um, this segment consists of our remotely operated vehicles, which I think we're most well known for, the tooling and associated tooling that goes with those vehicles, um, and also our survey services uh, business lines. The second um, business segment is manufactured products. And, and this segment in the, in the offshore oil and gas world uh, consists of several different product lines of, of products that are sold into the space. But they also do uh, several theme park entertainment systems, as well as some automated guide vehicles that are used for uh, inventory uh, and, and um, operational processing of, of jobs. Uh, so quite a big business line there as well. As you mentioned in the introduction, I run the third uh, business segment, which is the offshore projects group. And this segment consists of our diving, installation, uh, IMR, inspection, maintenance and repair, uh, controls and interventions businesses, and, and also has a small engineered solutions business for the things that pop up that we don't know how to solve yet. Um, we also have an integrity management and digital solutions group. Um, this segment really is about uh, asset integrity and life extension of assets in these harsh environments. Um, and they also have a few businesses that really work on uh, global data solutions. So keeping track uh, of media and other data associated with, uh, with the life of your field. And then our, our last but not least uh, segment of the company is the aerospace and defense technologies, which we call ad tech. And, um, and really here they're focused on defense, the defense market. So subsea technologies, marine services and space systems for defense. So enough of the, uh, of the advertisement for oceaneering. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, offshore wind. The, um, the offshore wind market, three of our, our five operating segments work with offshore wind today. So subsea robotics is doing a lot of survey work and the ROVs are quite busy, ROVs and vessels with uh, both construction activities, but also those inspection maintenance and repair activities, right? These, uh, any kind of energy uh, production we do offshore takes maintenance and repair, and it's very important to stay on top of these things in these harsh environments. Um, our offshore projects group does a lot of route clearance for cable lay construction activities in the North Sea. Um, we also do some field support, inspection, maintenance, and repair activities, such as inspecting the welds of the monopiles uh, on these fixed structures in the, in the North Sea. Um, and then the engineered solutions uh, in this space really is coming up with the solutions to problems on a daily basis. It, it really is an evolving market segment for us. And then, uh, you know, our integrity management and digital solutions also does a lot of work in this space. And it's more topside with inspections of blades, turbines, uh, and the, the monopiles that are above the waterline. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what I see as some of the emerging technologies. And, uh, and I thought Barry did a, a, a great job in his presentation talking about how much we've learned in oil and gas and how much we could use of that in offshore wind. And then James followed up with the supply chain and the, and the infrastructure as well. And so I agree with both of those wholeheartedly. Um, but, but what I'm seeing is, is kind of three uh, or two main categories of, uh, of emerging technology. So the first category is listening to our customers and addressing their immediate needs. And sometimes we can do that with our existing portfolio of technologies. Um, however, oftentimes we have to take what we know and actually design something else to be used in this space. And uh, one example would be our, one of our new uh, work class ROVs, the Isaris. And, and what we found with the offshore wind in, uh, in the North Sea is that there was really a need to be able to operate in high currents, uh, five knot type currents. And, um, 
you know, we don't have much of that in other places of the world. Gulf of Mexico, if we have a three knot loop current, everybody's getting excited, right? And shutting down operations. So to go to five was, was, uh, was quite interesting. And, and what it required us to do is really take the, the guts of, a, of an ROV and then try to change it to where it can handle this high current. So, you know, the surface area of the vehicle, the buoyancy, the uh, electronics, everything had to be adjusted to work in this, this harsh condition. Um, another thing that, that today is, is answering the needs for our customers, most of these developments, you know, the margins are, are pretty thin for the developers. And, uh, and so they need to be efficient with how they do the installations uh, or the maintenance and the upkeep of the, of the facilities. Um, so we're actually using a lot more remote capabilities now um, so that we can reduce personnel offshore and reduce exposures to uh, any kind of health, safety, and environmental uh, for those personnel. So really what that means is, is that we can operate ROVs offshore from a command center on land. Um, we can do some survey activities. Uh, without having to have people offshore operating this equipment from, from land. Um, and then a side benefit that we've gotten from that really is the, uh, the additional benefit is that we get subject matter experts uh, available to interact when problems occur, right? So you can go straight to the, the top resource um, if needed to get things done. So that's quite exciting. The second thing, uh, the second category that we're seeing really with technology uh, and innovation is the things that are way out in the future and really is gonna require some innovation to fix. And, and James mentioned some of the challenges with, uh, with floating wind and some of the technologies that are gonna be needed in that space and Barry referenced some of the soft soils. Um, all of those things are, are, are areas that we can work towards uh, solving. It's just engineering, right? And, uh, and it's just going to take some focus to, to get there. Um, some, some things that we're looking at that we're anticipating for, for future needs, you know, we talk about the inspection, maintenance, and repair activities. It is expensive to run a, a vessel offshore, burn diesel, and drive around looking at windmills. Just doesn't, to me, sound like something we want to do. We want to be carbon neutral and carbon efficient, right? So we're looking at resident vehicles. We have uh, a couple of ROVs in the, in the North Sea now that, uh, that are work class and that are resident. We have the EROV uh, working in the Norwegian sector. And then we have a new ROV called the Liberty, which will also be an autonomous uh, with, limited, with limited work class uh, as well. So, um, a couple of other things that we've looked at just because we, we see a need in the future. Uh, one we're calling um, uh, ocean perception, which would be marine life observation systems. A lot of concerns around marine life, both on the East Coast and the Gulf of Mexico, and we need to be able to know what these, these animals are doing and to be able to protect them. Um, we also are doing some work with drones for topside as well as subsea inspections. So drones that fly to check out the, uh, the blades and the turbines and drones that crawl to go down and inspect the welds on, on different subsea structures. Um, and then last, you know, we really are seeing a need for visual inspections to be uh, or all inspections, but visual is the one that I think of the most often, uh, to really be stored in a vault. And we need to be able to see how things are changing over time. And that way we can uh, properly update our um, estimates of the life of the asset. Last, I, I just wanted to tee up a couple of things for conversation. Uh, what can we learn about Europe? You know, one, one of the things that, um, that I hear a lot of different opinions, whether I'm working in Brazil, North Sea, or, or Gulf of Mexico, is about local content. And I, I think one of the things we need to think about as Texas and, a Gulf, and the Gulf Coast states is what's more important to us right now. If, if gross domestic pro, uh, product and job creation is what's most important, 
then I think we need to push the local content really hard. The, um, however, the flip side of that is if you relax some of the local content uh, requirements, we may be able to take advantage of some of the technologies and, and experience that uh, areas that are a little further on the maturity path in this space uh, could help us. Um, I wanted to talk about public policy. One of the things that I've seen uh, in the UK specifically, you know, they came out with the Energy Act in 2013. Um, and this thing got really, um, really aggressive from the development standpoint for uh, nuclear and renewables and, uh, and really set a, a, a firm demand for what kind of energy requirements they were going to take from this space. And when you have, uh, you know, policy, investors, and supply chain all moving in the same direction is really when powerful things can happen. You know, James uh, works for an operator developer, uh, uh, could be both, but, um, but, you know, he was talking about how he needs to pull through his, his vendors and his supply chain to really help him get to where he needs to be. And, and, and I think that's really powerful and that's something we need to think about. We need more forums where we can have these kind of conversations. Um, adaptability of the energy infrastructure, I think is really important. Um, Gulf of Mexico, we have a, a, a great opportunity that we don't necessarily have in the North Sea, which is uh, an abundance of natural gas, right? And I think natural gas uh, could maybe help us bridge as we're making this energy transition towards carbon neutral. Um, so something to think about there. And then a concern is really the, the, our grid and how flexible is our energy grid you know, Barry was showing kind of, or talking about the price of energy at different places in the U.S. It's not always easy to move this kind of power. And, um, you know, be some pretty long transmission lines. So I'll leave it at that. We need to think about the grid. And then, um, and then the last is, is just a lesson learned from Europe. The technology development really is fast and furious and things really are obsoleted uh, within months. Um, so sometimes I think that this makes people um, focus more on the cost of the innovation than the value of the innovation. So that's a, that's a word of caution to watch. Uh, but it's also something that I think uniquely positions the Gulf of Mexico. There has been a ton of innovation in oil and gas, uh, seafood, and any other industry uh, on the Gulf Coast. And, uh, and I think we're a proud people with, uh, with a strong experience in doing so. And I think offshore wind will be the, the next opportunity. Ben, thank you for that. That was a, uh, another great presentation. So we have, uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, you know, I did want to, I did want to attempt to summarize some of what our panelists have covered today. Um, you guys have been incredibly industrious answering the questions in the chat panel. So I'm very impressed, Barry and James, you guys have knocked those out uh, for the most part. We had, we had a couple of questions about uh, policy and, and, and technology and other things. I wanted to ask just kind of a general question for you all. Uh, we talked a lot about the infrastructure and existing experience in the Gulf to date. Can you just help some of the lay people like myself understand you know, to what extent you can leverage existing right of ways, platforms and other structures um, if you were to develop in a significant, significant uh, manner in the Gulf of Mexico? Like, can you can you repurpose an existing platform? Well, I can talk a little bit from the regulatory standpoint. From the regulatory standpoint, you require to decommission. So your structure has to be decommissioned in accordance with federal regulations. To repurpose that structure, it gets complicated because whoever wants to reuse that structure now is responsible for the ultimate decommissioning of that structure. And if that company or entity goes bankrupt, it falls to the record title owner of that structure. So from the legal standpoint, 
you've got to get straight. Do you have the bonding in place to decommission that rig? The other part is engineering. These rigs are made to structurally to do a certain thing, to handle a vertical, well, to handle a vertical drill stem. You're looking at lateral movements with a uh, wind. So there's engineering concerns and whether that particular structure is structurally sound after 20 or 30 or 40 years of operation and can handle the lateral energies that are applied from a windmill that's placed on top of it. The other thing is, is that you got to get to shoreline. One structure with one windmill is not going to be economically feasible by the time you wire that back to shoreline. You need an array to make it economically feasible. So the problem with repurposing existing rigs is the decommissioning, the engineering, and the economics. While it sounds like a good idea, you've got to really look at the details. Now, if a company wanted to utilize an existing rig to provide energy to surrounding rigs, then really what they're still looking at is decommissioning of that rig, if they're willing to go ahead and supplementally bond that rig, and the engineering aspect. There's always the engineering aspect. And you're placing a windmill where helicopters service rigs. You've got to consider the safety factor. So, so there may be some pilot projects in the future that look at a lot of these questions. But right now, using that existing rig to put in some type of an array it's going, you're going to be met with a lot of challenges. It's not impossible, but you've got to be under, got to understand what's in front of you before you can start repurposing rigs. James or Ben, do you want to add anything to that? So I, well, I, I think um, I think I think Barry, you've, you've pretty much covered it. I mean, liability on um, decommissioning is a is a real big one. Um, I think the in terms of reusing structures and capability and pipelines you know that there, there's a lot of projects going on now of you know offshore wind can lend itself to helping with secondary technologies and, and hydrogen is is a case in point in that and if you've got rigs out there that uh, uh that, that, that transport gas there there is a potential that you could create a hydrolyzer on the existing platform and utilize the the infrastructure to get that back to shore <clears throat> Sounds really easy. I think it's <laughs> in reality, it's incredible, incredibly difficult. But I see that rather than repurposing, because you know, even if you use the top sides as a substation, you know, substation loads are, are wholly different from from oil and gas top sides. You know, the transformers are incredibly dense and tend to have point load right in the center of the the um, the, the structure, um, and that that drives your foundation design and and lots of other things that go with that. I do see a future where offshore wind can potentially complement some of the existing assets that are out there. So hydrogen through gas or providing power um, to, to those uh, platforms. Um, if it's, you know, if you've got platforms that are in close proximity, there's potential to, to certainly utilize offshore wind. I, I think every time we look at repurposing specifically for an offshore, so a turbine on it or, or as a substation, liability in decommissioning but also the fact that these things are designed for a specific pur pur purpose and then we tend to need them for a very different design uh, basis and design purpose and that that's hard to bridge that gap i'll just add a, a quick comment ryan i i agree with with uh both barry and jim i i think repurpose uh, opportunities are probably slim the uh, I think where the the opportunity is is that symbiotic relationship between offshore wind and the existing infrastructure that we have. That that could yield some fruit and make this thing a little a uh, little more economical. Great, that's helpful. folks. So we have we have different kind of uh, levels of ability to leverage existing infrastructure, and uh, maybe it has more to do with the ports and and the uh, the workforce than it does with the existing structures in the Gulf. That that's really helpful for me. Um, can you can you all talk a little bit about what considerations you'd have to you'd have to take into account as you're building something that can sustain a hurricane season like we just or we're still in the midst of? What what is that? How much different is that from the North Sea or the East Coast? Uh, I, I'll I'll kick off and say well I think every area that you look to install offshore wind um, has its own. Uh, 
own set of unique challenges. And I think hurricane season is exactly that. And, and I think, you know, so, so when we're looking at the Atlantic, when we're looking in the Pacific, when we look towards Asia, you know, the, the, the seasons and the type of extreme events you have absolutely feed into the design basis of the equipment and foundation types that we see. And it's one of the reasons why we as Shell look at a multitude of foundation design types, because not every foundation design, if it's floating, for example, will be able to withstand the conditions of the site that you're placing it in. So, so we see that effectively, certainly it's a challenge, certainly it's not insurmountable. I think um, that both the turbine and the foundation, you know, the design of those will be specific to the conditions that we see. Um, and uh, yeah, that's one reason why th there's not one floating foundation that fits all sites. And, and we already see that from Europe to Asia, different foundations come to the fore. And I think it'll be the same um, for, for uh, Gulf of Mexico, even Gulf of Mexico versus California, different conditions. You'll probably see different foundation solutions, for example, um, uh, between the two. Yeah, I, I, I see it the same way. I think, um... I wouldn't have big concerns with the floating facilities or the fixed structures. We have a lot of experience in the, in the oil and gas industry uh, building things to withstand uh, hurricane season. I'd be more focused on the turbine and the blades and, and what's, what's going to be the strategy there. Is it a rig it down and, and hunker down for the storm or is it build it to where it can withstand something that might happen? So it'll be a fun project for sure. That's great. Um, I, I just have one kind of general question to, and there, I'm acknowledging that there are questions we will, will not be able to get to. So maybe it would be appropriate to have a part two to this conversation sometime in the future, uh, since there is a, a, a good amount of interest. Uh, but you know what, I know you said, I know you, you talked about all these different factors, but what in general just makes you in a sentence or two optimistic about wind development in the Gulf? So I can, I can, I mean, effectively, I think I said it uh, earlier. I think, you know, when, when you look at the skills and the infrastructure and the facilities uh, that you need to deliver complex offshore projects in harsh marine environments, I, you know, the, the, the differential between oil and gas and offshore wind is just all around that, the hazards and the number of units. So, you know, we don't have, um, you know, process safety, for example, isn't on the unexpected loss of containment of hydrocarbons, it's on the unexpected loss of containment of energy. Um, and although that sounds different, really the skill sets and the, the fact and the design and the way you do that, and, and then how you can build or construct with the, the jacket fabrication facilities with the ability for the ports to be able to support uh, that kind of fabrication, to me, lends the Gulf of Mexico as a, a very strong place. You know, you're, you're not starting from scratch with an industrial offering it, you know you have the capabilities with a little bit of tweaking and a little bit of finessing here and there most importantly selecting designs and supporting concepts that suit the port infrastructure that you have and then i think the real um the real kind of uh, opportunity can be around you have time to plan and the east coast is now in the position where we've got you know huge targets um and every project for example in transmission is trying to get their own connections for the Gulf of Mexico, you have the luxury of time to get that right and start thinking about how best to integrate the projects now and how best to invest in the infrastructure to support um, offshore wind in the future. So, you know, I, I would certainly use the time to, to make it a success just through good and prudent planning. I'm sorry, but I have a hard stop at three o'clock, so I'm going to have to drop off. But again, thank you for the invite and I look forward to more future discussions about this topic. Thanks so much, Barry. Thank you. So I think, yeah, with that, we actually are at time here. Um, and I think we might, uh, like I said, take the opportunity for a future discussion, but I do wanna, I do wanna to wrap up. If you have questions about, um, <clears throat> pardon me, if you'd like to learn about more real Houston events, uh, like I said, check out our website, renewableenergyhouston.org and join the mailing list. Um, you can also send a direct email to info at renewableenergyhouston.org. But I really want to thank all of our panelists and our, our uh, and all of our participants today. Uh, we will make a, a recording of this discussion available to you. Um, 
So you should be able to, to go back and review some of the really, I think there are really some really dense uh, and, and digestible points that might, we might want to come back to and think about a little bit. So thank you all so much for your time. I really enjoyed the, the discussion today. Thank you. Okay.